Yeah, so today, when the last lecture, so it's a little bit, I apologize in advance, so it's not very structured, so it's a kind of collection of random thoughts, and uh, it is um, partially drawn from um, blog posts that, that uh, I started writing it probably two years ago. And uh, if you try to predict how the, the field would evolve, you would approach uh, the best experts in the field and ask them what do they think. And then that's how it was born, that it was introduced. And then it, it seemed to be quite, quite successful. So we did it with uh, Petr Vinic Bridge another time uh, uh, last year, and hopefully we'll do it this year as well. And uh, basically, I, I will show you opinions that are not only my opinions, but maybe I have selected only those with which I kind of agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, maybe to start with, uh, so this is uh, from Will Hamilton, so if you're not familiar, so he's the author of uh, GraphSage, one of the, the, the uh, first scalable uh, graph neural networks, and um, basically he uh, say, says that, that basically there was a kind of reconciliation in the, the field of GraphML with the fact that um, there are fundamental limitations uh, of message passing. So, uh, as we've seen with uh, device for lemon, uh, uh, graph isomorphism works some tests, right? Because of the equivalence of message passage to, to WL, we have limited expressive power as a result. For example, we cannot detect certain structures like triangles or, or uh, cycles or clicks. Another problem, so if we are uh, to discuss uh, what are the, the possible drawbacks of standard GNNs, and maybe here I should use <coughs> more precise terminology that, that also Francesco used, uh, message passing graph neural networks, which is probably the more popular and the more general uh, flavor of graph neural networks that, that are being used. Uh, so the fact that you also make the input graph used for propagation of information uh, results in phenomena like uh, bottlenecks and overstuff. We've seen it also in, in, in his lecture today, how this potentially can be addressed by graph environment. And there is a little bit of um, kind of a sacrosanct uh, way of regarding graphs uh, in, in, in this community. So you shouldn't touch the graph because it's part of the input, but in fact, many uh, graph neural networks uh, in the disguised way do it. For example, if you do neighborhood sampling, de facto you are not using the, the input graph, right? So, uh, the, or if you're using attention, so you're me waiting the graph, so you're not using the input graph, you're using something else that is constructed for, uh, for your problem that, that you're trying to solve. Uh, so another thing that this is also what uh, Francesco brought in his talk, so there is kind of a mantra in deep learning that, that the deeper you go, the better. Right? You shouldn't say that that, uh, that doesn't help. But in graph neural networks, it was uh, kind of the opposite. So so. Most of the graph neural networks, uh, and even though we like to call it geometric deep learning, are actually not deep. They have two or three layers. And I also wrote a post about it and it was received quite a heavy, heavy portion of criticism. People are saying, look, we can do 10 layers, we can do 50 layers. But these are more exotic examples. And there, there are fundamental differences actually between graphs and other domains. Uh, so there are interesting results, for example, saying that there are certain functions that you cannot compute uh, no matter how deep you go. For example, what we've seen with the, with the limitation of vice for lemon. On the other hand, there are certain uh, uh, certain quantities that you need a, a minimum, a certain minimum number of layers in order to be able to compute. I think Parabash had a paper like this in Europe since 2019. So another problem that is associated with that is the phenomenon of forest moving that we've also seen that uh, as you go uh, deeper, basically, if your uh, if your um, diffusion layers, right, or uh, conversion layers act as a low pass filter, then basically all the features become the same. And also, uh, there was a kind of folklore, for example, that convolutional uh, graph neural networks are not good enough in order to deal, uh, uh, to deal with, this, with this phenomena. And as a result, for example, when the graph structure is not compatible with the structure of the data, the features or the labels, so in the heterophilic settings, you shouldn't be using GCN. We've seen today again. Apparently, this folklore is not true. So actually, GCM can be useful in this case as well. So, uh, and then of course there are uh, other techniques. So you can depart from graphs, and uh, this is what, what Chris showed. Uh, and you can construct uh, more exotic, more complicated objects, such as, for example, cellular complexes. So this actually has been done for 
quite a while, maybe not necessarily in the form of learning, but in the form of signal processing on uh, uh, simulation complexes. So let's say Sergio Barbarossa from Sofienza has been, uh, has a paper about this, uh, I think at least five years ago. The problem is that the starting point is a simulation complex. It's not a graph. So here the main difference is that we start with a graph and we invent something that, that starts from a graph and uh, basically leads us to, to, to some more interesting object that, that has maybe more interesting structure on which we can do uh, uh, we can do more interesting uh, operations. That's exactly what uh, 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 what happens in this uh, in this case. So there are also some uh, interesting exotic uh, versions of graph networks. So this was the paper of Kramer. Actually, there are two Kramer Kramers, uh, Milo Kramer and uh, Kyle Kramer, apparently not related. Uh, so Kyle Kramer was one of the discoverers of the Higgs boson. So this was a, a work um, that, that they did with DeepMind, and uh, the idea that was uh, that we have a multi-particle system, so that, that is described as a graph, so the interaction of these particles, they learn uh, generic message passing uh, uh, functions, and then they uh, regress uh, symbolic equations from these message passing functions, and they show not only that, uh, in, uh, that it generalizes better, but you can also get uh, basically a formula that, uh, that describes this uh, this physical system. So uh, this goes a little bit in the direction that the uh, paper is very uh, excited about, which is um, neural algorithmic reasoning. So if you compare, uh, let's again remain in the in the domain of graphs. So uh, let's say you want to do certain things on graphs. So you can have an algorithm such as Dijkstra's algorithm, right, that computes the shortest path between uh, between nodes and uh, Basically, algorithms so they are very explainable, right? So you know exactly what they do, right? So you know that Dijkstra computes the shortest path. They generalize uh, to any data, right? So if you compute it on one graph or another graph, it will produce uh, the same results. It doesn't generalize across tasks, right? So you cannot use Dijkstra to compute, I don't know, for example, to, to do a graph partition. Neural networks are uh, they maybe the, the opposite extreme. So uh, you don't really understand what they do, so they're not very explainable. They are uh, kind of generalizable across data, but they do generalize across different tasks. And basically, there are some efforts to try to, to marry these, uh, these uh, two universes, and uh, neural algorithmic reasoning tries to go in this direction. But then another uh, big topic, well, and, uh, I definitely not an expert in it, so I'm just showing what, what has been done, and especially in the domain of biology, uh, it has become quite popular because now, with uh, high throughput um, techniques, you can take a cell and uh, perturb it with CRISPR knockouts, so you can turn on and off some genes, and you can see basically what happens to the cell. And this way, you can try to discover a graph that, that, that describes the, uh, the the causal relations and try to understand, for example, how disease like cancer uh, is caused by different mutations, how drugs uh, interact with the cell, and, and so on and so forth. So, the the problem that existing methods uh, do not really scale well. So typically, these kind of networks are relatively large. So these are graphs with tens of thousands of nodes. Uh, so that's roughly the number of uh, genes that we have, about 20,000. Uh, and uh, the computational complexity is not, is not there yet. Uh, then another interesting topic is knowledge graphs. And knowledge graphs maybe uh, here is used in, um, in two restrictive settings. So uh, this was a, a community that, that existed and evolved in parallel with graph neural networks. So there are some methods that are used there, and they are not somehow widely known or used in, uh, to people that, that work on, on graph neural networks. So one of the classical examples is uh, the family that is called, uh, called TransX. So the idea with knowledge graphs typically have triplets of um, objects, so you have nodes and uh, a relation between them. For example, typical, uh, typical case would be, you would say you have a node, uh, uh, let's say Tim Cook, right, so a person, uh, you have a node, a company called Apple, and the relation uh, is CEO of. So the, 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 the idea of, of methods of trans E and uh, similar uh, style is to embed the uh, nodes and the edges in the same space, such that the, uh, the embedding of the relation between them of the edge is modeled as the difference between the, the, the endpoints, uh, the nodes, uh, uh, the endpoints of the edge. So basically, you, you, you want the, the, the embedding of the relation to coincide with the difference between, uh, between the two nodes. 
And these methods actually are being used not only for knowledge graphs, so they are originally developed in that community, but they are used in general for any kind of heterogeneous data. So you can think of Twitter, right? So you have users, you have tweets, you have many different uh, different uh, types of edges and uh, types of nodes. So I already mentioned it, so I would uh, I would like to mention so that uh, again from the same blog post that, that, that from which I started. So Thomas Kipp, from the, the one of the authors of GCN, uh, that uh, also noticed this uh, trend of uh, separating the computational structure from the data structure. And uh, uh, one of the forms that it takes is uh, graph invariant. So uh, this is example that Francesco mentioned in his talk. Uh, uh, Deagle, diffusion improves graph learning. As we show in the paper, it doesn't always improve graph learning, so it was a little bit of an arrogant title. So that was from the group of uh, uh, Stefan Gunemann at, at Munich, or uh, the, the curvature based environment that Francesca showed in, in, uh, in his paper. And uh, basically, the, the idea uh, that, that we have of using curvature in um, in relation to graphs, so it's basically borrowing concepts from uh, continuous objects and applying them to graphs. Uh, so it is quite interesting, even though there is no direct analogy maybe of these uh, of these concepts, yet you can, they, they can be quite useful. And uh, one uh, such example, you can actually think of graphs as continuous objects. So there is an uh, uh, entire field that is called uh, network geometry. So Mogulni, I think, is one of the, the, the representatives. And uh, you can, for example, uh, create uh, small world networks by uh, uh, by k neighborhood, neighborhood something in a hyperbolic space. And the reason, basically, what, what happens in these kind of graphs, like uh, social networks, is that the volume grows exponentially. So uh, if you think of a Euclidean space and the, how the, the volume of uh, Euclidean moles behaves, so it grows uh, polynomially with uh, with the radius, right? I think pi r squared, right? So two dimensional mole. So it grows exponentially with the dimension, but it grows polynomially with the radius. If you try to embed uh, such graphs in uh, in Euclidean space, it becomes too crowded. So you have too many neighbors that you need to squeeze into into this uh, into this uh, this wall. On uh, in a hyperbolic space, on the other hand, the the, the, the volume grows exponentially with radius, and therefore it, they, they have become popular in in the past few years for embedding certain types of graphs, so usually. Ontologies, trees, but also uh, but also social graphs, and uh, it is also an interesting question. So this is another paper of uh, Francesco. So uh, what uh, characterizes these kind of spaces is that they have constant curvature. So you can take a hyperbolic space with constant curvature and say that uh, uh, okay, I want to embed my graph, and somehow on average the curvature of the space fits better the graph, so I, I get less disturbance of the distances. So if I try to recover, for example, the graph from from this embedding, then uh, Get less errors. Typically, what people look at is uh, whether you can uh, predict the edges. So, if my neighbors really correspond to the to the neighbors, uh, the neighbors in the, in the continuous space correspond to the neighbors in the graph. Uh, so, there have been recent papers. I think Christopher had uh, a recent paper last year, where they construct spaces that are product manifold. So, you can take, for example, a manifold with positive curvature and take a product with uh, a manifold with Negative curvature, it's still uh, it's still homogeneous space, right? So the curvature is fixed. Uh, on the other hand, we know that in graphs, uh, the curvature can be different. So there might be some parts that look more uh, uh, positively curved, right? So look like clicks, and maybe there are bottlenecks that, that are negatively curved. So, uh, and again, here you can see an analogy between uh, these kind of spaces. So we want uh, to find the space in which we can embed this graph with uh, without the distortion. So here I'm talking about preservation of high order structures like, like triangles and rectangles. And uh, this actually, this was an idea of Francesco that he took uh, results on which he worked on uh, in, his, uh, in, in his PhD. And basically it's uh, it's also a product manifold where you have a rotationally symmetric uh, factor that uh, allows you to control the curvature. So you can uh, embed in such a way and match the curvature, the Ricci curvature of the, uh, of the space with a discrete Curvature uh, or the analogy of the, the Ricci curvature on the graph. And uh, in terms of the distance preservation, it acts uh, in the same way as uh, the, the base space that you use, for example, hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic space, but it allows you to preserve better 
uh, order structures, and you can see that the graph that is being covered for such embeddings is uh, way better and more similar than uh, uh, to the original graph than if you use uh, standard spaces with, with constant curvature. So it's uh, a little bit exotic, and uh, the applications uh, where this, uh, this difference might be prominent uh, really requires to go beyond edges. So we need to talk about the definition of, uh, of more uh, interesting structures. So this is also what Francesco mentioned in his talk. So uh, thinking of graphical networks as uh, dynamic systems, essentially some physical system that is governed by uh, a differential equation. So diffusion is uh, the, the probably the most obvious thing that comes to mind. And uh, well, if I have time towards then, I will talk about some previous works that, that preceded the graph where we looked at uh, nonlinear diffusion equations uh, from which we can uh, derive uh, graph neural network models. Then the fact that we have a system that, that evolves the features, so basically we have some dynamic, dynamic behavior of uh, the features on the graph. Uh, so you can think of this uh, this time as a kind of pseudo time, but you, you can also have situations where the graph itself uh, is dynamic, is changing in time, and uh, this is something that, that comes as part of the data. So if you think of a social network being like Twitter, uh, the graph is not static, so it, it it is, it is live, right? So some users uh, create uh, new links in the graph. So I can follow somebody or unfollow somebody or a new node can be added, right? So a new user comes to the, to the social network. So um, it is a kind of small niche that, that is, in my opinion, still underexplored. And it's interesting to see how these two different times interact. So the evolution of the graph itself that is given as part of the data versus the evolution of uh, data on the graph that, that uh, is produced by for example, uh, a graph neural network. Well, generative models that we skip it, but uh, mainly important in chemistry where you try to generate new graphs with certain properties. So it is uh, much easier for images because images have some canonical uh, reference frame, right? So you can number all the pixels and just uh, generate the, the intensities of the of the pixels in graphs, you need to work hard. And, uh, there, there are some works that try to do it, including diffusion models, but I would say that uh, this is still uh, an interesting and important problem. Then, uh, looking at how uh, machine learning and maybe in particular computer vision uh, fields has evolved uh, historically, so uh, I think it's fair to say that research has been driven by benchmarks. So benchmarks like, like ImageNet where have a clearly defined task that everybody somehow agrees that it's important. And then we have basically a standardized evaluation protocol uh, allowing you to compare to a state of the art. So you don't need to rerun everybody else's methods as it used to be in the past. For example, 10 years ago, uh, basically we were comparing apples and oranges, right? So to compare to another, to another paper. So uh, image that, at least in this sense, has created a very uh, easy way to, to replicate uh, and uh, to. to incrementally improve uh, previous results. Of course, it has created another negative phenomenon that I think we are, uh, we are starting to see in this community as well. And uh, everybody's complaining, but somehow everybody subscribes to its obsession with with performance. And you often see the views like in Europe. So, so this method is not state of the art because it's uh, uh, one tenth of percent worse than some paper that, that was published, but uh, it has a standard deviation of 5%. So, uh, uh, Still, I think it's a very important effort. So, uh, in particular, OGB, Open Graph Benchmark, uh, that, that was introduced by the group of uh, UNESCO at Stanford, uh, also about, I think, three years ago, and is now probably the de facto standard. So, I think we should uh, probably uh, take it to some extent with a grain of salt, the salt and also contribute to the evolution <coughs> of, uh, of these benchmarks because uh, not, uh, not all of them were great. So another important uh, question that is uh, often overlooked in uh, uh, in the machine le learning community in general, I think in, in graph learning in particular, is uh, the choice of hardware. So somehow we deal with graphs that fit into the, uh, the memory of a GPU, and if they don't fit into the memory of GPU, then we don't work with these graphs, right? But uh, this is not a, an option, in, uh, for example, in the in the industry where we have gigantic graphs, and there is no way that you could them into a single processor, 
So you need to do some, some distributed computation and then suddenly you realize that if I'm sending a message between two nodes, it actually matters a lot if the two nodes sit within the same memory or they sit in different memories. And this is usually not accounted for. On the other hand, for example, if you uh, talk to people that work in scientific computing or in super computing, so there is no way when they solve gigantic systems of, of equations that your solver doesn't account for uh, the way that the, the underlying hardware works, right? So you know exactly where your data sits, you know exactly how your, your decomposition, how you send information from, from uh, one computational load to another. And uh, it is interesting actually that, that semiconductor companies are uh, also realizing it. And there are some new players, for example, Craftcore, that uh, apparently works better than uh, NVIDIA in some graph learning tasks. So this was a collaboration with them and uh, on, again, take it with a grain of salt because it was a particular setting, a particular architecture, and they showed that uh, if you design carefully the graph neural network, you can, gain, uh, you can get a gain of about the order of magnitude over NVIDIA. So uh, apparently, so the, we published this in, in the model post, apparently it ended up uh, on the desk of, uh, of uh, Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA, and he was a bit unhappy. So uh, NVIDIA suddenly started uh, saying that, why don't we uh, also uh, uh, help you to, to accelerate some, uh, some graph learning tasks. So uh, again, I'm saying that take it with a grain of salt, <clears throat> because uh, you can probably do a lot of uh, uh, fine tuning of the algorithm itself so it is better compatible with hardware. Usually, we don't do it. So, uh, and again, uh, when you deal with large scale applications, then uh, it becomes uh, it becomes more important uh, than ever. Then, what is also cool about uh, graph neural networks in particular, but I think also more broadly, genetic deep learning, that there is uh, a lot of possible applications in the industry, in, uh, in, in sciences. So I mentioned uh, some of them in the, the in the introduction. So uh, uh, this is again just a very tiny sample of uh, uh, what people have been applying these methods for, uh, ranging from particle systems to, to from particle physics to to, uh, to social media to, to structural biology and uh, and drug design. So in social networks in particular, this was probably one of the first uh, commercial uses of graph neural networks, at least to uh, my knowledge. Uh, the, Ulysses and his team implemented a version of Graph Sage uh, for uh, recommendations in Pinterest, which is uh, a US uh, social network that is based on images. Uh, uh, so that was, I think, around 2007. And then uh, Graph Neural Networks have been seen in production by various companies. I think Airbnb recently, and uh, this is an example from Uber, recommending uh, what food you might like. So uh, these, these companies collect a lot of information in the form of uh, usually associations between users and uh, some products. So in the simplest setting, you can think of it as a, a bipartite graph. So you have a user, for example, that bought a certain item, and uh, then you try to predict uh, links in this, uh, in this graph. And there is a zillion of uh, nuances and different considerations. Uh, so it's probably more complicated than just uh, thinking of it in this way, but at least uh, as a mathematical abstraction. This is how a simple recommender system might, uh, might look like. So I already mentioned the, the startup that we had uh, that was acquired by Peter. So there we actually, uh, we were uh, encouraged by some empirical results so that appeared on the cover of science uh, uh, several years ago, but basically empirical finding, looking at the way that misinformation spreads on social media, that, that was organically different from uh, the, the propagation of other stories. So we tried to build classifiers that try to detect it. So without actually looking at the content itself, looking just at the way that it propagates. And uh, we got uh, some encouraging results. So, so the Peter obviously was interested. So that was also in the, the uh, before the presidential elections in the US. So everybody was very worried about uh, about the misinformation and fake news. Uh, but basically, uh, these kind of algorithms uh, are important. Uh, being used by, by, uh, by Fisher and I guess other social networks as well for uh, different applications, <coughs> not necessarily misinformation, but overall uh, uh, platform health. Yeah, and this was uh, the team that, that was acquired. So um, 
I also mentioned applications in uh, computer graphics and computer vision. So there, uh, a very natural model for uh, three-dimensional objects is, uh, is meshes or point clouds, depending on the application or volumetric data. So point clouds are a typical type of data that you get from uh, LIDAR sensors, so self-driving cars. This is what uh, the self-driving car uh, sees. And uh, for example, Uber, so that was already a few years ago, I think uh, this division now became uh, a standalone company. So they used uh, 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 craft neural networks uh, in order to try to analyze uh, this kind of data and, for example, uh, predict potential uh, hazards. So, Incoming accidents and, and so on. Uh, so I also show this uh, example. So this is actually pretty old. So this is before the genetic deep learning. So that was uh, uh, markerless motion capture that was using uh, a 3D sensor. Actually, it was uh, our 3D sensor that that uh, previous company that we sold to Intel for the real sense. Well, uh, sounds like a very antique history, but uh, in this case, uh, these these kind of applications you can definitely build 3D. 3D avatars from noisy input. So that was actually, uh, I think, one of the early examples of um, uh, variational to encoders for meshes for shape computation. So it doesn't look well, uh, but uh, uh, there are many, uh, many follow-up papers that uh, got significantly better results. So this is another example uh, uh, for uh, uh, generation of, uh, of faces from point clouds. And uh, this is also the example that I showed. So that was collaboration with uh, with a company called Meriel AI, where we did uh, reconstruction of hand poses uh, from uh, uh, from two-dimensional images. Uh, so this is also an interesting example. So uh, what you see, it looks like that it's a pretty poor reconstruction of three D uh, uh, three D face from uh, an image, but that actually it's not from an image; it's from genetic information. So it's face from DNA. So this is uh, the work of my collaborator. Uh, Belgium, uh, in their class, and uh, apparently there are many um, properties and uh, features of the face that, that are encoded genetically, and you can uh, try to recover them. So maybe this kind of uh, this kind of example is a gimmick, but uh, for example, in, in forensic applications, you can try to, uh, to, to to predict how a person looks like uh, from uh, a sample of uh, genetic material. So, can be for example in order to identify uh, a dead person. Uh, they also uh, use it to identify uh, people from the past, so prehistoric people or some ancient king. I think uh, they did also they also did it. But uh, I, I think I find it personally quite fascinating that this is at all possible. And of course, the more serious applications is trying to understand uh, um, genetic diseases how they uh, manifested uh, in facial geometry. So in physics, uh, graph neural networks apparently have become also quite popular, and uh, uh, in particular in uh, particle physics, where you build these kind of gigantic machines. So this is LHC, or it's actually part of the one of the detectors there. Uh, so uh, the detector creates uh, these kind of images. So you know, mm -hmm. you bang to, to uh, beams of particles, they collide and create uh, many new particles to you know, detect their properties by, by these uh, colossal detectors, and you try to understand what happened here. So the problems uh, range from reconstructing the jets, so you want to understand basically from a few samples in these detectors what actually arrived there and how it flew and what trajectory it followed, to the classification of events. And uh, if you think that LHC is large, so uh, this is ice cube. So it's located in the, in the, the South Pole, and it's uh, it's probably the case where the expression of the tip of the iceberg can be taken uh, very literally because the detector itself is within the ice. So it's a cubic kilometer uh, underneath in the ice. So that's why it's called ice cube. And it's essentially it's an array of photomultipliers that pick up uh, radiation that comes from very rare events when, when neutrinos that, that, that the Earth is bombarded with uh, interact with matter and they produce what's called Cherenkov radiation. So uh, this is how the typical event looks like on uh, part of this uh, array. So the color here represents time, and uh, this is I think, the, the energy that is deposited at every, at every point. And you try to understand uh, where this neutrino come, uh, comes and uh, whether it's, it comes from astrophysical source, like a supernova uh, explosion. And uh, so this was a collaboration with uh, 
the particle physicists from there. And uh, so this is another example where theoretical deep learning is used to actually to model the detector. Because here we, use, we model as a graph the signal on the um, on this uh, irregular grid of detectors that has a higher resolution core in this uh, in this way of detectors to, to, to classify astrophysical events. And then this is another example. So this is the work from uh, DeepMind. So we used uh, graph analytics to fluid simulation. Basically, you can solve uh, some complicated system of differential equations. And with, so here it was done by learning that by doing this, you can accelerate significantly uh, simulations of complicated uh, complicated fluids. So structural biology is probably one field on which I will personally bet, literally. So bet money. Uh, uh, um, is uh, um, and I think the, 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 this is where um, the, the impact of theoretical deep learning has really been uh, quite remarkable. Uh, so I don't know how much you know about biology and, and proteins, but uh, basically proteins are really the, the most important biological molecules. So uh, some people call them the molecules of life, and probably it's not an exaggeration because we uh, currently don't know any life form that is not based on proteins. So everything is proteins. From viruses to, to, to elephants or in whales, uh, maybe somewhere uh, uh, there is extraterrestrial life with that is different, but apparently at least we, we haven't seen it yet. So uh, proteins are actually encoded in our DNA. So if you know that, that in our body we have about two billion of such letters, so these are called nucleotides, uh, four of them, and uh, inside the cell, basically the DNA is wrapped. And then it is translated by special machinery into a sequence of uh, amino acids. So there are many proteinogenic amino acids from which all the proteins in our body are constructed. And you can actually see that there is a table that translates uh, triplets of nucleotides that are called codons into particular uh, uh, into particular um, uh, into particular amino acids. Uh, why it is encoded in this way, I think nobody knows. So apparently there are some chemical considerations, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a big uh, it's a big enigma of biology to, to, to what I know. So basically, it looks like a, the long chain of uh, small molecules, so it's biopolymer. And then uh, under the influence of electrostatic forces, it folds into uh, complicated structures. So typical structures are like this, so a sheet and a helix. And then it becomes basically even more complicated, so it's called secondary tertiary structures. And the good analogy for it is the snake toy. So it's one dimensional thing, but you can rotate it and bend it in certain ways. And basically, you can build more or less anything out of this snake. So, uh, proteins are more complicated because here the angles uh, are discretized in proteins. So the problem of predicting the structure of protein from the sequence of uh, amino acids of which it is composed. Is uh, called protein folding, and this has been a classical problem in structural biology. So it was uh, postulated by Ankins and uh, uh, Nobel laureate in chemistry in 1972 that uh, this folding can be is determined by uh, by the uh, sequence of amino acids plus the environment. So proteins uh, change their property for example, if you if you heat them. So uh, and this has been uh, a a holy grail of structural biology, so people tried to predict it. It turned out to be quite a difficult problem. Uh, and for the past uh, 50 years, uh, uh, there, there was a, a gradual process, so uh, gradual progress in this, uh, in this domain. And uh, similar to computer vision experts that, that have the image net, structural biologists have the, 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 the cusp computation, where they have uh, amino acid sequences of proteins for which the structure is uh, withheld, and then you try to predict it. And, uh, you measure the accuracy in some way. And uh, structural biologists, biologists have had their own uh, image that moment with uh, a newcomer from the mind of the whole in 2018 that, that uh, was significantly better than anything that existed in the field. And now, alpha fold 2 is already claimed to, to achieve, at least in some settings, uh, accuracy that is comparable with X ray crystallography, which is considered the, the, the golden standard for getting the, the, the structure of the, uh, of the proteins. So basically, you can computationally now predict uh, very well the, the structure of the protein, and, and it opens uh, uh, interesting possibilities in, for example, in designing new theories. Um, 
So the, the one of the, the main blocks or main ingredients in AlphaFold is what they call invariant point attention, which is uh, a geometric uh, geometric um, architecture. So it's an equivariant message passing network. So an equivariant transformer. Uh, uh, so we talked about the equivariants. So uh, in this case, it is equivariant with respect to the continuous transformations of the, of the atoms uh, in the uh, in the molecule. And uh, because proteins are ubiquitous, so they appear practically in any important biological system that we have in our body or other organisms, uh, uh, whether it's uh, defense against pathogens, right? So antibodies are special types of proteins. Uh, the hemoglobin that transfers uh, oxygen to your cells is also a special protein. Uh, uh, any chemical reaction in our body wouldn't happen because the catalysts uh, make these reactions happen. Uh, Called enzymes, these are also of proteins and, and so on and so forth. Even our skin uh, uh, owes its elastic structure to, to a special protein that is called collagen. So, because they are so important, uh, their uh, proteins are standard uh, targets for drugs. And typical way that, uh, that a drug looks like is uh, you have some protein, it does something, so it participates in some chemical reaction. Uh, you try to inhibit it. So. It, if you look at the protein as a geometric object, so it will have some uh, irregular uh, holes on its surface, and you try to find a molecule that will fit into this hole and will block some process. So you will have some, maybe some site on which a chemical reaction happens. So if you attach something there, then uh, this reaction will not happen. And as a result, well, something will happen in the body, for example, uh, you will. Uh, a certain disease or a, a process that is associated with disease will not be happening anymore. So actually what I show here is not a drug, well it's a drug-like molecule, so this is caffeine and this is how it binds to the adenosine receptor in the brain. So when we went to the coffee break, when you uh, drank this stuff, so this is how it acts on your body. Actually uh, one of the chemists made a remark that this is not caffeine and indeed I couldn't find uh, an image of caffeine, so this is uh, a similar compound. It's quite, uh, uh, from the chemical class of what is called xanthines. So for those of you who know chemistry, so it's a little bit of cheating. Now, unfortunately, not uh, every uh, protein target looks like this. So it's wishful thinking to believe that there will be this kind of pockets. So they're easy to drug, but how about this? So these are uh, what is called protein to protein interactions. So it's uh, a case where you have two proteins that bind to each other, and you want uh, to prevent them from binding. Where this happens, so what is shown, what I show here is uh, what is called program death uh, complex. So it's a special mechanism that, that tells our immune system that that this is a healthy cell and you shouldn't attack it. And, uh, this was you know, important in the, the discovery of immune therapy. Basically, uh, certain cancers uh, produce these proteins and then they evade the, the normal response of the immune system. And uh, uh, what is called the checkpoint in therapy. Uh, tries to block either PD1 or PDL1, so it's the two proteins, and this way uh, the, the immune cells, the T cells, can kill the cancer cells. And actually, these uh, drugs have become uh, uh, very promising, and there are already some of them that are approved. And if you have, if, for example, a, a decade ago, you had certain types of cancers, such as melanoma or certain types of uh, blood cancers, then it would be probably a death sentence. Uh, in some cases, not anymore, because uh, now with these biological drugs that themselves are a protein that uh, actually are designed to bind to one of these uh, to one of these proteins, uh, uh, this uh, this disease can be cured. And usually, these proteins are antibodies, so you can actually there is a naming convention. So uh, uh, any drug that that uh, sounds like something zoom up, so these are uh, uh, humanized monoclonal antibodies. So that's uh, Special engineered antibody that 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 that, 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 uh, that does something like this. So probably the, the geometric analogy here is the, the lock and key metaphor. Uh, then you have uh, only one particular geometric configuration will fit into the lock uh, and will open it. Right. So same way with proteins. So if you have uh, essentially a complementary surface, then uh, proteins will bind and uh, will, uh, will react. Otherwise, they will try. So there is a, a great deal of selectivity, and this is the, the, uh, the description of how the the, the, uh, the, the immune therapy works. So this was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2018. 
Now, uh, what it essentially entails, if you want to design such a biological drug, so you want to solve um, a kind of uh, inverse protein folding problem, even though the biologists don't like this term. Uh, but what you're trying to do is not to predict the structure of a protein from amino acid sequence. You are asking the opposite question. So I, I want to achieve a certain structure. What would be the amino acid sequence that produces this structure? And there is this kind of, uh, it is tempting to say, okay, we have sequence, right? Which is a very easy object to, to work with. And in fact, early works in bioinformatics worked on sequences because, well, it's a string, right? So it's easy to align the computer. Then from sequence, you get to structure. So that's essentially protein folding. And then structure uh, determines the function of the protein. So if it looks in a certain way, right? So there is some kind of hole or concavity, then there will be another, uh, maybe a convex shape that will fit into it. But uh, the, unfortunately, the reality is significantly more complicated. And you can find examples of, for example, uh, proteins with similar sequences, but dissimilar structure. So I can have maybe one unlucky mutation that completely changes the way that the protein looks like. Or it can be the other way around. So there might be proteins with completely different sequences, but when they fold, they create, uh, they create the same structure. And uh, well, again, I'm not an expert in it, but from what, uh, from what I understand, there are examples of what is called convergent evolution. So we have uh, organisms that develop differently, but for some kind of biological magic that, that they evolved uh, similarly shaped uh, proteins, even though the, the starting conditions were completely, completely different. And finally, you can also have proteins with dissimilar sequence, dissimilar structure, but they do the same thing, right? For example, they bind some, some proteins. So here's an example for completely different proteins, and yet all of them bind to, to, to this kind of site. Here as, as a mesh. So uh, what we conjectured, so this was a work with um, and still ongoing cooperation with uh, colleagues at uh, ETFL, uh, Korea, uh, is that uh, these kind of properties, uh, uh, what really matters for them is the molecular surface of the protein. And here's an example. So I think this video show is, it shows it well. Uh, so when the protein interacts with the molecule, right, so here's an example of a small molecule that fits into this uh, kind of hole, uh, you don't really care about uh, what's inside the protein, right, or how complicated uh, is the folding. What the molecule that interacts with this protein sees is a surface, right, that is uh, shown here with this uh, transparent uh, plastic. Uh, and therefore, you can abstract out a lot of details, right, and uh, if you work with the surface and uh, uh, you can also, if you treat it in a certain way, right? So as we've seen it in, in, in the previous lectures about, uh, uh, about uh, mesh convolutions, then you will also get uh, at least some approximate invariance to these conditions. You also need to understand that proteins, they're not static objects. So it's tempting to think of them as a kind of three-dimensional puzzle, but in the fact is that the presence of, of a partner protein changes the configuration of the, the, the protein to which it binds. So they undergo uh, conformational changes uh, as a result of so it's a kind of non-rigid puzzle, and sometimes the topology changes dramatically, so things can open up. Uh, uh, but uh, from what I know, there are, there are many cases where it doesn't happen and we are sufficiently interesting. So basically what we did, uh, essentially, well, I can tell the story. So, so Bruno came to me with, uh, because we were working at that time on shape analysis, so that was around 2016, I think, or maybe even before, and he said, why don't we use one of your uh, architectures that, that some of the early mesh architectures to apply them to proteins. So we wanted to learn this kind of descriptors, and this is what we did. So it was really a very primitive architecture. So you also need to understand that these are uh, uh, these are uh, charged surfaces. So in addition to geometric properties, they also have chemical properties. So it's not only not only geometric complementarity, but for example, we have uh, opposite charges that, that uh, attract each other, or similar charges that, that repel each other. So it's it's more complicated. So basically, we had. Uh, uh, surface that is decomposed into patches for which we pre-computed uh, uh, pre these uh, chemical and geometric features, and we applied uh, a mesh convolution to architecture uh, uh, similar to what we uh, showed yesterday uh, on these kind of features, and uh, basically tried to address some standard tasks in, uh, in, in, in structural biology, for example, trying to predict uh, the site at which proteins uh, are likely to bind. Or for example, if we have uh, some pocket and we know that it's already binding something, what kind of molecule will it bind? Or if we have many proteins, we can try to find uh, which of them uh, are likely are likely to bind to each other. So, uh, 
the protein for the interaction search. And here's an example for the protein side prediction. So it's a binary classification problem. And uh, this is how it looks like. So the, uh, you can uh, use this information for training. So you know that the protein binds something. So this is the green is the ground truth. And uh, you train on this kind of, uh, this kind of examples. And uh, this is how uh, this is what you get from a prediction. So this is the interface score. So red means that this region is likely to bind to something. And it actually coincides very nicely with, with, the, uh, with the ground truth. And this was used by uh, Ron and his team to design new proteins. So uh, the way that it works, you typically start with some seeds or some small protein on uh, which you attach uh, a bigger thing that stabilizes it. Uh, but the, the key property here is that this uh, small uh, uh, piece uh, binds to the site that, that you want, okay, to the protein that you want. So in this case, these are three different designs that uh, bind the, the PDL1, the, this oncological target uh, proteins. Now, just to give you an idea, so I'm not a biologist, I'm a computer scientist, just to give you an idea of uh, what it entails to, to, to work with biologists. So this, was, so this paper was in 2020, it took about two years to do, but as, uh, as a reward, we got to the, to, the, uh, to the cover of Nature Methods. So this is a recent paper that, that uh, uh, we now published on BioArchive uh, a few weeks ago, another two years of work. So uh, in this case, so these are experimental, this is experimental validation. The computations, and uh, what you see here is uh, the spike protein of the of the nasty thing that, that uh, causes COVID, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, one of its uh, versions. Uh, so, if you zoom into the uh, this part of the spike protein, you see where it actually binds to the, the ACE2 receptor. I guess we are all experts now with COVID. So, this is uh, uh, this is a protein that that uh, happens to be in our lungs. And this is where it binds, and that's where uh, the, the, the virus enters into the host. Now, uh, what we predicted with uh, with Massive, with this algorithm, is another binding site that was previously unknown, that is shown here in red. And uh, we designed a binder that, or I should say they designed a binder, uh, uh, that binds to this site. And you can see, actually, two versions here. And uh, this is uh, an experiment that shows uh, the binding. So basically, this curve means that as you change the concentration of uh, of the protein that you introduce, then uh, uh, basically the, the, the binding signal increases. And uh, here is uh, the structure of the protein that is obtained with uh, cryoM. So uh, and you see can, that you can you can it coincides very well with the predicted structure. So this is what you need to convince structure biologists that it actually looks like as what you computed and what you predicted. And these are actually uh, real experiments uh, of uh, uh, trying to neutralize the virus, obviously in vitro. But uh, so this one is binding to proteins uh, taken from different variants of the virus. So you see that it binds to many variants, to some of them not, but basically there was some mutation that changes the structure apparently. And this one is the neutralization. And here the, the, the baseline is uh, the clinically approved AstraZeneca uh, antibodies that are used actually to, to, to cure this virus. So it is obviously worse, right? So if you can see that the, the signal that, that we get with uh, uh, AstraZeneca is better, but still what you see here is totally data-driven design. So it was not something that was produced that was experimentally in mice by some kind of uh, mutations. So this is something that, that, was, uh, that was designed computationally. I think, I think it's very cool. So it's not, uh, well, and it's uh, still from the baby steps, but it's already at the stage where most of these designs actually work. So I think out of the five proteins for the oncological target, I think only one failed to crystallize. So we can get the structure maybe if it worked. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, but uh, this was to show not not so to tissue uh, biology, but just to show that uh, uh, there is a lot of details if you want to work on this uh, field. So that's why you need to work with people that, that understand it. And, uh, can actually do uh, this kind of work. This is, ask yeah. Uh, so, it, did you like search for this drug by the database, or did you generate? So, the, the, the database in our case, so this was database of this kind of small peptides, small seeds, for which we computed the, the, the fingerprints, and then yeah, we searched for the one that fits well. And then, well, we raise uh, uh, details for how we optimize it, how we would define it better. But that, that, was, uh, <laughs> that was the search. Uh, and uh, this, this thing is uh, the, the, the binding site. 
so um, I should say that this architecture it was uh, old and uh, not very efficient. So you can see the, the way that it works. So starting from uh, uh, starting from the atomic point cloud of the protein, we compute first of all the, uh, the molecular surface that is represented in the mesh. You can see the time that it takes about six seconds. Then we compute the features. So the features were pre-computed in the in the original architecture about 20 seconds. Then you extract the patches. So this is a small uh, uh, geodesic circles around uh, and also that, that was again as computation and also required a lot of storage because these were pre-computed and, and used so about uh, about one minute. And then of course uh, computing uh, writing everything so once you did this pre-computation was was very fast. So we uh, decided to switch to a very different representation that worked not with meshes but with point clouds. So we start with a point cloud, then we represent the surface as a point cloud, as in the oriented point cloud. So we have normals <coughs> essentially every point. The features were computed automatically from, uh, uh, from this point cloud, and you see that it was way faster. So actually, the speed up was the, up to three orders of magnitude. And what is important that everything was computed on the fly and everything is differentiable, and that's why it's called D massive. So we can change an atom here, and uh, we will get immediately uh, a change in the output. So there is nothing that is pre-computed and stored. So potentially, I can ask the question, if I know how my complementary structure looks like, I can optimize for the protein by moving its atoms to get the right structure. So I can, I think I can, do, uh, I can do protein generation. And well, uh, in business model, you also mentioned so we, uh, the construction that we used for, for uh, quasi geodesic convolution is uh, I think quite similar to what you described. So uh, this is a point cloud, and uh, we have normals at every point. So this is how we compute uh, uh, an approximation of these uh, of these geodesic convolutions on, uh, on the point cloud. So the the, the our conclusion was, was that uh, when the point cloud is sufficiently dense, and because you have normals, you don't really need uh, the mesh. It's quite key interest. It's less convenient to work with meshes, especially when you want something that is end-to-end -end differentiable. And here is a comparison of the uh, of the computational time of the forward pass, and this is the memory usage. So you can see uh, that, that it's uh, quite significant gain. So the vertical axis is the accuracy. And I think it was in the in the site uh, prediction. So we uh, actually lose nothing, or maybe almost nothing, uh, by uh, Passing to this, uh, to this representation. Uh, yeah, and this was uh, this was massive. So that was the, the original paper. So uh, I'm pretty excited about it because I think uh, it, it opens the interesting opportunities in drug design. So in fact, I think uh, uh, contact with Cosi all the time by, by different pharma companies and they, they, uh, that, that, that want to use this technology. Maybe some of them are, are already using it. Uh, for uh, the, for designing new proteins. So, in general, when you when you think of uh, drug design, so it's uh, really a long and expensive process, and uh, well, one of the reasons is that, that you need to undergo uh, a lot of rigorous uh, clinical trials to, to understand that the drug actually doesn't kill your patients. One of the, the reasons, though, in the initial at least uh, stages of drug discovery, uh, has to do with the fact that the search space is extremely large. So I don't know actually how these estimates are made, but uh, typically what is what what, what you read in, in, in chemistry uh, literature is that the number of uh, small molecules that are synthesizable is something like 10 to the power of 60. And so it's really really very large. So for, for reference, the number of uh, proteins in the universe is about 10 to the power of 80. So uh, it is very large combinatorial number. So probably most of these molecules have never existed. It's not, it's not obvious that we can actually easily, easily produce that. So what, on the other hand, we can test in the lab is probably thousands of molecules, or maybe with modern high of chemistry, maybe hundreds of thousands, but uh, probably not way more. So you still have a huge uh, gap in terms of what is potentially available and what, what is potentially testable. So usually this gap is breached by, well, you can obviously do uh, some, some experiments, but usually this is breached computation simulations. So you, you simulate the properties of the molecules and actually graph neural networks uh, originally were reintroduced into the field of chemistry. So as we know from the first lecture, the uh, originator at least the uh, precursors were uh, developed in chemistry for molecule search. 
uh, Gilbert's paper on message passing neural networks from 2017 actually tried to bring forward neural networks, like solubility and uh, toxicity and other uh, properties. And there are some standard benchmarks that can use, like Zinc or uh, SK09, that, that uh, have a list of molecules with uh, uh, measured or simulated properties, and you try to bring them from the structure of the and graph neural networks really achieved something like five orders of things in speed up from the so, so previous methods. And that, that was already five years ago. So uh, now the field has uh, progressed quite uh, quite dramatically. And uh, I also mentioned this uh, cool paper that appeared in 2020 on also on the cover of cells, one of the most important uh, journals in biology. That was uh, the work uh, at MIT where they used uh, graph neural networks in a virtual screening pipeline trying to predict uh, new antibiotics. So, you, you all know that, that uh, antibiotic resistance is really a problem in medicine. It's partially because uh, well, it's some problem. You know, just take antibiotics without uh, knowing that whether it's a bacterial or viral infection. And uh, some of the bacteria are mutate and survive and develop resistance. And I think now the estimate is about 2 million people dying every year from Resistant organisms, so it's a matter of time when it becomes a big problem. So, anyway, what they discovered so, one of the findings was that, that uh, a drug that was originally uh, developed as an anti diabetic drug called Calicine actually has strong um, antibiotic properties. Now, some people that come from the, the biological community uh, criticize it, saying that the properties that graph models predicted were kind of obvious. Was that to do with the membrane depolarization that actually makes the cell die? But I think it's still impressive that, that you can get it uh, uh, from the data. Um, so, another interesting approach is um, when it comes to drugs is uh, to reuse existing drugs that underwent all the clinical trials and were approved uh, uh, to reuse them either against uh, new targets. Or use them in combination. So you take two drugs, and apparently, hopefully, there will be some nonlinear synergy between them. Uh, or it could be actually the other way around. So you want to avoid, for example, some uh, antagonistic interactions. So there might be some combination of drugs that actually neutralize each other, or maybe some uh, dangerous side effects. And this was uh, probably the first use of graph neural networks for this purpose. The work of Marik Zitnik, who is now at Harvard Medical School. So she tried to predict side effects of pairwise drug interactions. Uh, uh, by modeling the, the biological system as uh, a protein to protein interaction with graph and uh, the drugs by uh, basically by telling to which proteins they bind. Actually, to thinking that we, we somehow mentally imagine the drug that, that targets very specifically the, the targets for which it was developed, but this is not true. Again, I'm not sure about the, the exact number, but something like 30 to 50 proteins on average are. Uh, uh, Basically, a typical drug will buy, buy this number of proteins. So it's not very specific target for which it was developed. So there's a lot of uh, side effects. And then with my collaborators at Imperial College, we tried to, to take similar ideas to, to apply them to food. And uh, you probably know that, uh, well, Maurice certainly knows that, that uh, every bite of food that, that we take, especially uh, food coming from, from the plant kingdom, uh, they are full with uh, molecules that, that, that are bioactive, so they, they, they do something to, to our body, of course, they come in uh, minute quantities, but the problem is that we have no idea what they do. So it's uh, really kind of dark matter of nutrition. So we know about uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and, and fats, maybe uh, vitamins and, and uh, micro elements, right? But uh, do you know how much, well, so you weighted your, your food today, uh, how much uh, indoles or flavonoids you took, right? So you don't know. Uh, and uh, many actually of these compounds, they come from uh, the same chemical classes as, uh, as drugs, especially uh, oncological drugs. And uh, this is sometimes reflected even in the name of the in the name of the drug. So, so a compound that is extracted from the bark of a tree that grows uh, in China called camphotericin. So four of its synthetic analogs are used as uh, chemotherapy agents against uh, certain types of drugs. And well, obviously classical drugs, so something as trivial as, uh, as aspirin, so the chemical name is uh, acetyl salicylic acid. So salicylic acid comes from uh, salicylic, which is the latent name of uh, the willow tree. And uh, it 
from ancient time into a slow analgetic properties. So anyway, uh, basically, if we uh, tried to, to predict drug likeness for a particular class of drugs of, uh, uh, of molecules. So uh, anyway, training a graph model network that uh, was trained on a set of FDA-approved anti-cancer drugs that were considered as positives, and uh, this allowed us to, to predict whether a molecule would be anti-cancer or non-anti-cancer. So we didn't look at the chemical structure, we looked at the, at, the, at the targets that we find. And then we can take uh, another molecule that comes from, uh, from a, a food ingredient and uh, try to predict whether this uh, ingredient can uh, uh, anti-cancer properties, whether it would likely be drug like Now, of course, this is uh, probably trivializing, but uh, we also have to convince biologists we have to look at the, the, actually the mechanism that, that this molecule uh, 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 exercises uh, in order to, to see whether for example it does like some anti-proliferation action or anti-angiogenesis or different mechanisms that are associated with cancer tumors but basically to reduce it to a single picture this is a food map uh, listing something like 200 food ingredients with the content of different molecules that, that are likely to, to be anti-cancer-like molecules. And you can see that probably it's a good idea to drink green tea or to eat cabbage or, uh, or citruses. So again, this is don't take it as a nutritional advice because this has not uh, undergone any clinical trials. So well, actually what we used as a proxy is uh, medical literature that, that was mined using uh, NLP uh, methods. But probably the cool part of it, well, maybe you cannot uh, use it in the clinic, but you can use it uh, in gastronomy. So this is the rule of our DNA, probably everybody knows DNA, that uh, uh, we collaborated with him uh, and we developed recipes uh, based on the ingredients that, 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 that we've identified. And if you wonder why uh, he's in his pajamas and in bed, that was collaboration with uh, the Vodafone Foundation that provided us uh, a platform of for distributed computing called DreamLab. So you can donate the idle power of your smartphone at night when it's useless, right? So you're not using it uh, to do uh, some number crunching. And uh, I think at the peak time, we had about 2 million uh, people. So it was, to the best of my knowledge, probably the largest uh, uh, social, uh, what is called, citizen science uh, project in the UK. So uh, how much time do I have? Yeah. Okay, so uh, enough about applications. I think it's good to end it on this kind of testy note. So let me say a few words about um, physics-based uh, or physics-inspired uh, graph machine learning. So uh, again, if you look at message passing, right, or the standard way that the graph neural networks work, basically there is a little bit of a symmetry between nodes and edges of the graph. So nodes contain information, right? So in the features, this is the typical assumption, of course, we can attach uh, features to the edges as well, but edges used to propagate information, right? So you can think of a kind of node being the data and edges being the computation, right? And uh, we've seen that message passing uh, is unable to distinguish between some structures. So here, one option would be to use some structural coding, right? So collision and coding. So you basically get more information and you color these features in, in a certain way. And we've seen that some graphs might be unfriendly for message passing. So here again, Graph wiring is a standard is a standard remedy that, that is used. Now, if we compare, and I showed this uh, slide as well in the in the first lecture, if we compare three objects, grids, meshes, and graphs that we've seen in this uh, in this course, uh, so first of all, grids can be sort of as a discretization of let's say plane. Right? So they have a continuous analogy. Uh, manifolds, right? They are continuous analogy of meshes, and graphs don't have continuous. Analogy. Right, or at least it's not immediate. So they are uh, from the very beginning, they are discrete objects. And this is, I think, this is unfair. Right? So we want some continuous way of thinking of graphs. Uh, second, the kind of structure that, that we have in graphs <laughs> is uh, um, probably the, the, the least structure that we have among these objects. So in the grids, for example, if I look at my neighbors, I don't have any ambiguity in the way that they get ordered. On a mesh, I have an ambiguity in the longer rotation. Become one neighbor and then all the rest are ordered automatically. And in the graph, it can be any arbitrary permutation. So, as a result, what we can do on the graph, for example, uh, there is no notion of direction, right? So, I 
or at least not not a trivial one unless you bring up some some additional information uh, all the filters on the graph are essentially isotropic right so information flows uh, equally in every direction because there is no direction and uh, we want somehow to uh, take a step back and revisit these problems from a different perspective and this perspective is the perspective of physical systems that we want to use uh, as a metaphor for learning. And the figure I show here is from a paper that appeared earlier this year in Nature. Uh, that was actually very cool. And um, what they showed is that you can integrate real life uh, physical systems into deep learning pipelines. So you can back propagate through an electric circuit or an optical setup. Now, this is not what I'm necessarily suggesting, even though it's very really cool. I'm suggesting to use it as a metaphor. So we have some physical system that we can simulate, and the output of this system will be essentially the, the, the prediction that we are trying to achieve, the input will be of our input, it will be data on the graph. And the system will have some uh, number of parameters, degrees of freedom that we can also control. So uh, thinking of it actually from this perspective of control theory it would be very nice. So uh, as a metaphor, think of an airplane that takes off and flies somehow, and you can, you can uh, change some control surfaces. So you need to fly it and land it at some point, right? So that's the, the desired output that you want to achieve some state of the system. And how we do it by telling you what can you visualize as a trajectory in this parameter space. And then you can ask the question, can I achieve a certain state, right? So that would be an analogy of progressive power. Can you achieve it in certain time? So that would be an analogy of efficiency, right? So I don't want a very deep network. Uh, that is nice and lightweight. You can maybe also ask questions about, for example, how well you generalize. Maybe you can pose it as, as some kind of uh, sensitivity to initial conditions and so on. And uh, probably the, the most straightforward way uh, to do it, and we've seen it in previous lecture of Francesco, is to think of diffusion equations. So diffusion equations in the, the in the plane, this is how it looks like, right? I don't need to explain what uh, uh, all these things organizations. So in the simplest case, we have some quantity, let's say temperature, right, that we know here by x. So the gradient, the, the difference in the, uh, in the temperature creates a heat flux, right, and a conservation condition that tells us that no heat is created out of nowhere and doesn't disappear anywhere means that the only change of the temperature in time will be uh, given by the divergence of, uh, of this flux. Right, and A here denotes the, the, the heat conductivity properties of the, uh, of the medium of the domain. And we can also think of it as a local differential version of the Newton law of cooling that tells you that, that the change of temperature is proportional to the difference between the object itself and its environment. This is exactly what, uh, what this, uh, this quantity measures here. So the simplest setting is when uh, the heat conductivity properties are equal everywhere at every point. In this case, I can this is just a scalar, so I can take it out and the versions of the gradient to a mass operator. So uh, we get the homogeneous isotropic diffusion equation. And it is nice because we can interpret it as uh, uh, the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy, exactly like the And in the Euclidean case, we even have a closed form expression. We can write it as a convolution with a gaussian. So it's essentially a low pass filter. And the fact that it's a low pass filter actually has been. Uh, very important in uh, computer vision and image processing uh, community, and I will show you in a second. But of course, you can um, make the, the equation more interesting. So you can say that this diffusivity uh, function depends on the position. In this case, you can get non homogeneous, non linear diffusion equation, or you can also make it direction dependent. So in this case, it's an isotropic. So it's a matrix valued function that scales the gradient uh, locally at every point. Now, what is also important to see here that you actually don't have any channel mixing, right? So if this is a vector function, then uh, basically every channel uh, acts on its own. Uh, they can be coupled through this uh, diffusivity function that, that can, be, can be dependent on x, but I cannot, uh, I don't mix channels, right? So again, why, where it has been used, it, it has been used in image processing where uh, if you want to do image denoising, Let's say this is your input image. I can just convolve it with a, a Gaussian kernel, so it will be a low-pass filter, and this way I average out the noise. But by doing so, you see that this is not a nice image to look at because you have smooth, also the noise uh, together with the noise, you have also the discontinuities in the image that that are important for visual perception. So the idea that goes back to Perona and Malik 
was that I want an infusion that is adaptive. So I want to stop the diffusion when I see a discontinuity step. And uh, this can be done by making uh, this diffusivity uh, function inversely proportional to the norm of the current. So the moment that the diffusion equation uh, senses an edge, it, the diffusion will slow down or stop. And that's how the kernel will look like, right? So it will be a normal Gaussian uh, uh, within a, a constant or smooth region. And when you have discontinuity, then it will look like uh, one sided Gaussian. And this is what happens when you filter the, the face of Newton with uh, this uh, nonlinear diffusion. So it will remove the noise in the continuous regions. And uh, uh, you, know, you don't uh, average pixels of different color. Now, what I said about the channel mixing, you can also see it here. So if this is an RGB image, so we have three uh, channels, right? So the, your data is three-dimensional, you have a pixel, you have R, G, and B channel. It makes no sense to make to mix R, G, and B. So each channel is uh, processed separately in this case. So you can apply it uh, uh, color-wise, uh, uh, the same diffusion equation, but uh, the, diffusivity, uh, uh, the diffusivity function may depend on all the three channels. Okay, so as they compare the, the pixels, if they have similar color as vectors, then, the, 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 uh, the, then this uh, constant will be large, right? So the diffusion will be fast. And if uh, the, the colors are different, then the diffusion will be slow. And there was uh, a zoo of different methods and books have been written about uh, PD-based image processing. And it was uh, aesthetically a very uh, appealing idea because you can say, I can define a functional that tells me how my image should look like. I can derive optimality conditions in the form of Euler Lagrange equations, and they have a gradient flow that, that evolves this image towards the, 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 the optimum of this function. And uh, all this disappeared because with, the, the, with deep learning, and the, for the same reason why, for example, all the handcrafted images disappeared uh, from computer vision, because it's very difficult to come up a priori with a functional that will work in any setting in every problem for every type of thing. Uh, so what we are trying to do is essentially revisit these kind of approaches, first of all, for graphs, and second, to, to apply uh, the deep learning tools that we now have to these settings. So basically, we'll be making these equations parametric with variable parameters, same way as Francesco showed. So in this case, we have a nonlinear version of the diffusion equation on the graph, as opposed to linear one. And you see that uh, it has exactly the same structure as uh, the, the Classical diffusion equation in the previous set. So we have the graph analogy of the gradient. We have the diffusivity function that uh, 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 denoted here by A, and we have the divergence operator on the graph. And uh, this is a nonlinear equation with uh, continuous time. So the way you solve it, you discretize it and solve for example the uh, explicit uh, forward Euler scheme. And uh, you see that if you rewrite this formula slightly, you get graph attention errors. Okay, so uh, basically you can interpret the diffusivity function if it's normalized uh, uh, appropriately as attention. So uh, GAT can be obtained as a particular setting of, uh, of a nonlinear diffusion equation on the graph. And of course, we don't need to stop with, uh, with explicit schemes. There is a zoo of different uh, discretizations and solvers for, for differential equations, implicit, semi-implicit, multi-step uh, uh, methods such as runge kuta and so on and so forth. And this is a very old field with probably at least 150 years of experience uh, of different uh, different uh, methods, techniques, and theoretical results. And uh, the way that we apply it, so we start with some uh, uh, initial conditions. So these are the features, initial features on the graph that can undergo potentially an encoding, as we've seen also in Francesco's talk. Then we uh, apply the diffusion equation. So we solve it uh, numerically. The diffusivity function here is parametric, but what is important that the parameters are tuned at the training stage. So the, at the inference stage, this is fixed. Okay, and what, what is also shown here is that the diffusivity is not time dependent. So this would correspond to shared parameters in all the layers. So every iteration of the numerical solver will correspond to a layer of a graph. And then the output can be encoded and uh, uh, it is trained based on the task that you're trying to solve. So the propagation is on the parameters of the, of the diffusivity. And you may say that it's well, it's just a formal exercise to, to revisit and to, to rewrite the same stuff that we had before, maybe just in some fancy terminology, but I think it gives more. And uh, it gives more, for example, that, that you can uh, prove some results like uh, convergence and stability. You can also use uh, 
more exotic solvers that currently, at least to my knowledge, don't have uh, immediate uh, implementations in the zoo of different graphical network architectures, such as, for example, multi grid solvers. Um, and uh, it is interesting. So, I'm not necessarily saying that it will provide uh, new architectures, I think it will allow to understand existing architectures better and make more educated choices because graph neural networks are very generic, you can do a lot of things. So uh, the hope is that uh, this will allow to, to make these choices better and more educated. And finally, it also provides links, as we've seen uh, with the, when Chris presented, it was uh, Francesco presented. Basically, this framework uh, provides links to fields that are more exotic, like differential geometry and algebraic topology. And uh, here's one example. So remember that we talked that uh, deep uh, graph neural networks are problematic. So with this framework, we can actually see that that uh, it's not problematic, and here the term depth itself is not uh, very relevant because instead of depth, we have diffusion time. It depends, the number of layers is the number of iterations of the solvers. So, depending how you discretize your diffusion equation, this number of steps can be different. And uh, for example, if you have fixed time, uh, right? So, if you uh, forward earlier, then indeed you can relate the number of layers to the, to the number of iterations. Uh, uh, and diffusion time, but in principle, you have adaptive schemes that sometimes make bigger steps, sometimes make smaller steps. So uh, it really depends. Now, uh, taking you back to the what we wanted to do is we wanted to have a continuous analogy for the graphs, right? And if you look at the discretization of the diffusion equation in the in the plane, so when you discretize the plane as a grid, so these are different ways I can discretize my differential equation. Let's say the last end, right? So usually you discretize it like this with four neighbors, but you can also discretize it like this or like this, or any convex combination will also be a valid discretization because the operator is linear. So what I'm trying to say here that you have a lot of flexibility in the discretization of uh, in the choice of your graph when you are solving a, a, a differential equation uh, on a continuous domain. So the graph itself, it's not something canonical, it's not something sacrosanct. You can, you can change it. So there is nothing special about this particular graph or this particular graph or this particular graph, right? As long as it represents the same continuous object. So we want to try to do something like this and well, maybe it's a miserable attempt to do it yet, but uh, at least I think the direction is interesting and that's exactly a kind of construction where you take concepts from the continuous domain of differential geometry and you try to apply them to a graph in a certain way. So it's not trying to find an, an analogy of a graph uh, or analogy of these continuous objects on a graph, but, but to use it, uh, to invent some continuous structure and use it uh, and use it to solve machine learning problems. So if we go back again to image processing, so we've seen the nonlinear diffusion equation. An alternative to nonlinear uh, diffusion equation is a, a non-Euclidean. And uh, the idea is that you can take an image and think of it as a, a manifold that is embedded in high dimensional space. So specifically, an image will be a two dimensional manifold that is embedded, uh, let's say if it's an RGB image, in five dimensional space. So you have a joint space that contains the positional coordinates, the X, Y location of the pixel, and the feature coordinates, which in this case will be R, G, and B channels, right? So we have X, Y, R, G, and B, so five uh, dimensional space, R5, in which you have a two-dimensional manifold, right? The image has two intrinsic coordinates uh, that, that is embedded in the surface. And this embedding allows you to define a metric, so pullback on uh, on this manifold. And with respect to this metric, you can write the, the last of time operator and write this diffusion equation that actually turns out to minimize uh, a, a more general version of the, the Dirichlet energy that is called the Polyhole function. It's used in string theory. Whatever, I don't know. I'm not an expert. Uh, this was actually the work of my PhD advisor, Ron Kimmel. So they uh, showed this model to, to do image processing. To do, uh, so it has the same effect as the, the kernel and Malik diffusion. And you can see that actually now the kernel lives on this manifold. And basically, because the distance is measured both with respect to the positional and the feature coordinates, the kernel will kind of wrap itself on the, on the surface. And uh, if you have a long distance, between two pixels because the, the colors are different, then uh, basically you will just get the tail of the kernel and you will not be, uh, not, not be doing uh, this kind of diffusion. So we can apply the same idea to graphs, and this was uh, uh, our paper that we called Blend. The previous framework was uh, very modestly called Grand. Uh, 
Uh, and here, the, uh, every node of the graph has uh, two types of coordinates. So it has uh, the feature coordinates that I denote by x, but it also has positional coordinates that I denote by u. And positional coordinates in this case is this kind of invented thing. So we can realize the graph in uh, a continuous space, doesn't need to be Euclidean, can be hyperbolic space. We don't necessarily need to, to be able to recover the graph from this uh, embedding. So usually this embedding will introduce some distortions, but we don't really need it because what we use it as a kind of auxiliary construction. So we apply uh, the, the evolution equation to, to both coordinates. And now what I can say that the evolution of these coordinates of the positional coordinates can be used for graph rewiring. So if I see that as a result of this evolution, two nodes come close and there is no edge between them, maybe I want to create it. Or if they drift apart, maybe I don't need this edge. So it can, I can change the graph to facilitate the flow of information. And uh, maybe it's a little bit complicated to explain it. So this picture, I think, uh, shows it way better. So this is uh, uh, a representation of the core graph, so citation network. So the colors here represent uh, some low dimensional projection of the features, of the node features. The positions of the circles represent, uh, again, some low dimensional positional coordinates. And uh, the task is known by specification. So we want the uh, different, we want to obtain different clusters that have uh, similar columns. And you see that, that the evolution uh, changes both the features, the positional encoding, and also the graph changes on the fly. You see that these points drift apart, so we disconnect. <laughs> so, and this is kind of task specific graph rewiring. So, the graph rewiring happens as we are solving the, the, this, uh, this diffusion equation. And then, of course, there are maybe more exotic uh, equations that, well, I think it's not correct for differential intelligence to call the Ricci flow diffusion equation the test. Uh, similar structure, so you can think it well. So on the left uh, side, you have the, the temporal derivative of the metric. On the, uh, on the right hand side, you have uh, second uh, order uh, quantity, the, the, the initial tensor. So it looks kind of diffusion equation. Of course, it has the different properties, but uh, uh, basically we can apply it as Francesco showed to, uh, uh, to the graph rewiring. And this allows us to address problems of bottlenecks when the information uh, doesn't flow well on the graph. And I think in general, what probably should be done is a, a kind of co-evolution of the graph and the features of the graph. So we want to, to be able to, uh, to have parametric processes that, like the, the diffusion equation that, that runs on the graph, and the graph itself also changes, and then the, the two processes are coupled, and we have a loss function that is uh, determined by a task, and we try to make these two processes uh, such that they will solve the, the task in the best way possible. And actually, that was uh, uh, first mention it, so that was honorable mention for best paper at IPR. And uh, well, we can guess uh, obviously uh, what is the best way to celebrate uh, a success of a Ricci flow paper is obviously with the battle of Ricci or Master Champagne. Uh -huh. And he's actually from the same from the same family, so probably the the wine itself is not good, but uh, just for the name, I think, uh, I think it deserves it. And then, of course, we can also design more exotic diffusion equations, such as uh, the, the shift diffusion that, that, that Chris presented. And this is uh, probably, well, I know that, that he doesn't like it, but I, I want to think of it in this way. Uh, that, uh, it is potentially an alternative to, to the vice versa element uh, uh, test uh, in the way that it allows us to think about the expressive power of graph tool networks. So the vice versa element, well, there was a, a lot of mileage done with this. Uh, uh, with this approach uh, in graph neural network literature, in a sense, it's uh, very uh, easy because it is more or less obvious, right? So graph neural networks actually are equivalent to, to vice versa element tests, and uh, a lot of different tests, right? The uh, version of these tests were designed with higher order graph neural networks. So here we are looking at the limit of uh, the of the diffusion equation on the shift, and we ask the question of what kind of uh, shift will is necessary in order to be able to serve sort of classification problems. And uh, I think looking at the limit of the, the diffusion equation is interesting, but probably what is more practical is to look at finite time. So in this case, this is also another interesting object that is currently completely ignored in the field is actually how the neural network evolves, right? So we always look at the final, uh, the, the output later, right? That what the neural network produces. We never really care about how it gets it, right? So here we can actually look at the dynamics and the trajectory of our features how they evolve to, uh, to arrive at a certain time t. 
And then by looking at this trajectory, maybe we can uh, get some more insight and uh, uh, design more uh, expressive architectures. So again, finishing with this metaphor, I think uh, we obviously we don't need to uh, think of uh, only uh, diffusion equations. So this was another paper that uh, we did with collaborators from ETH uh, Zurich. Uh, instead of considering diffusion equations, we considered oscillators that are coupled by graphs. So classical oscillators, every node has uh, uh, some second order uh, differential equation that has a kinetic term as a result of some uh, wave type behavior plus dissipation. And this uh, what uh, uh, Konstantin Rush, the first author of the paper, uh, was presented last week at uh, CML, showed that you can uh, prevent phenomena such as, uh, such as overspoon. And uh, this brings me to the last question that, that I would like to ask. And again, here, uh, probably I have opinion uh, that uh, probably doesn't agree with, let's say, what Beto uh, thinks. Is it correct to call these kind of architectures message passive? Of course, depends what you see as message passing. You can say that anything that is computed on a digital computer is message passing, right? So even match multiplication. But probably a good uh, uh, example that I can make here. So if you think of diffusion equation, uh, in some situations, let's say on a grid, you can actually write a close or solution uh, for the diffusion equation as a convolution with some curve, right? Let's say on the Gaussian. So I don't really need to do a lot of small message, pa uh, 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 message passing steps in order to, to get to this solution, right? So I can I can take a kernel that takes multiple nodes away, and uh, it gives me the output of the neural network. So uh, uh, I don't know what 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 would be the, the alternative to call it, uh, but uh, I think it's not necessarily falls within at least the, the strict sense of message passing, at least in the way that it's used in graph neural networks. But uh, overall, what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, probably physical systems, uh, as diverse as they can be, they provide the rich world of, uh, from which we can draw uh, these metaphors that we can then discretize and get uh, uh, graph network architectures. Some of them will correspond to what already exists and maybe allows us, uh, will allow us to understand uh, existing models better. And some of them will maybe result in completely new architectures that will be better in some ways, maybe more efficient, more stable, uh, and so on. So I think uh, it's probably too early to say, but at least to me, it sounds like uh, an interesting thing. And it is also a good way, a good uh, uh, hook to uh, take mathematicians and uh, bring them into this field. Because uh, this is just vastly been studied in applied mathematics for, uh, for over a century. OK, so uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much. So I think, well, I'm not an expert in statistical physics, so uh, I, I would say almost certainly yes. Uh, and maybe also beyond genetic deep learning. So I think in deep learning, uh, there are interesting uh, analogies between uh, uh, systems used in statistical physics and uh, deep learning systems, uh, like adding models of also. Uh, uh, yeah. Short answer is uh, definitely. More questions? Any 
general about the course. Comments? Uh, Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 On the job to do the pop, how do we say it? Every game, every nice game, last. <laughs> no. Okay, let's thank Michael again. <laughs>